Major funding for Due Process is made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding is provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual, publishers of print and electronic information for and about the legal community, including the legislative manual. Shakespeare suggested we kill all the lawyers, and nearly 400 years later, there are still some who think that's not a bad idea. I'm Raymond Brown. I'm proud to be a lawyer, but the fact is, we have some problems with our image. So on the docket for this edition of Due Process, attorney ethics, misconduct, and discipline. We'll meet a lawyer who's been on both sides of the process and the president of the State Bar Association. But first, here's Sandra King with a look at another piece of the process, restitution. Raymond, restitution comes from you and all the state's lawyers, whether they like it or not. It's a fee imposed across the board to pay back clients who've been ripped off by attorneys. In fact, the legal profession is the only one that makes good on the abuses of its own. And in preparing this report, we met some people who were awfully glad that's true. Oh, I gave him 700 to begin with in his office. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Okay. And what about the other money? He took it. He took it. Everything. And everything for this elderly, sick widow was nearly $100,000. Money stolen from Alice Reed while she was in this nursing home. A nursing home that refused to let her stay when her lawyer, to whom she had entrusted her life savings, claimed there was no money to pay her bill. He said he would take care of things. And Mrs. Reed had reason to trust her lawyer. Christopher Riley had a law degree and an office here and he was no stranger. I knew his family. His sister was in my children's high school class. His father worked down in our town. His mother was their school teacher. I trusted him. So after two destitute years in a boarding house room, Alice Reed wound up in this public housing project, while her lawyer wound up in the Salem County Jail. But these days she can pay her bills, thanks to what happens inside this room. Uh, my name is Luis Sanchez, and I have the privilege this year of being the chairman of the Lawyers Fund for Client Protection. The room is inside the state's justice complex because the fund is a committee of the state Supreme Court. But at $50 each per year, it's all the state's lawyers who gave Mrs. Reed back all of her money, who make good on New Jersey's bad lawyers. What we're talking about is the conduct of literally a handful of people out of 61,000 lawyers admitted in, Jer in New Jersey. So it's, it's just, what we're talking about is aberrational behavior, um, but whatever it is, that's what we must address. You solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to the board shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. This man's son was injured in a car crash. There was a cash settlement, but the family never saw it. Their money, too, went no further than their now disbarred lawyer. It's gratifying to be able to tell you that we have unanimously approved your claim in the amount of $31,159.65. If it appears that you had an attorney-client relationship, and if you um, uh, suffered a loss as a result of dishonest conduct within that attorney-client relationship, and th th there's a, a great likelihood that the trustees will make an award. And unless you've lost more than $1 million, chances are the award will pay back every dime. Last year, that added up to nearly $4 million, more than double what the fund paid out just one year before. In order to have a claim considered here, the lawyer against whom the claim is filed uh, must be at least uh, suspended, if not disbarred. In 1995, there were a record 48 lawyers suspended and 33 disbarred. Last year's numbers were not much lower. And among the disbarred was this woman's lawyer, Douglas Black. He said he would get back to me um, after the holiday, which would be on a Tuesday after Memorial Day. 
He never called. Her case began with the sale of this home. Proceeds put into his trust account until a lien was settled from an SBA loan. He didn't receive any money, and I kept calling and calling and said, you know, Douglas, we, we need the money. We're in the process of building this house, and we need the funds. Funds they needed to pay for the new house they were building, $93,000. But they found the account had been cleaned out. I called his office immediately, and they said that he was away at um, some rehabilitation hospital. It's a pattern this board has gotten used to. A factor clearly is compulsive behavior, addictions and compulsive behavior. Alcoholism, uh, drug addiction, and compulsive gambling clearly have a, a significant role in, in what we see. I mean, he, he was a very charismatic, seemed like a nice individual. You know, I would never believe in the long run that it would ever come down to this. But client protection paid up for her too. The director says that's only fair, but he admits that it's also good PR for a profession that suffers from chronic problems with its image. Those who believe they'd lost their life savings only to have them restored by this fund acting on behalf of all the lawyers in the state, uh, if that restores their faith in the legal profession, that's great. I mean, with the we think that's fine. <laughs> that's the way it ought to be. Of course, the Client Protection Fund doesn't just pay out. It also does its best to collect from the dishonest lawyers who stole the money in the first place. Often by the time they're disbarred, there's simply nothing left, but not always. Last year, the fund recovered more than half a million dollars. And the Client Fund's work is just one of the legal profession's efforts to lift the lawyer's tainted image. Not only does the misbehaving lawyer face some serious discipline, but Raymond, as you know, it is public discipline, too. And Sandy, when that discipline went public two years ago, it caused an uproar that, at least in some quarters, is still with us. And it's just part of the controversy still surrounding lawyers and ethics. Questions we'll explore with the state bar president and with a lawyer who specializes in suing other lawyers. So stay with us. When you graduate eventually from law school, the public will finally experience the impact of your presence as a member of the legal profession. And during the course of your future legal careers, you're going to serve clients and in doing so profoundly affect their lives and perhaps their fortunes. Surely the people you will serve are going to expect you to enter the profession not only well-trained in both substantive and procedural skills, but also possessed of an awareness of the, show, the social and moral responsibilities. What exactly did Justice O'Connor have in mind? And are there questions of ethics and discipline still outstanding? For some answers, we turn to Cynthia Jacob, who's the leader of the state's lawyers, and Hilton Stein, who's an expert on suing lawyers, but who's been on the receiving end of the process himself. Welcome to both of you. Thank Hi, you, Ray. Let me start with you, Mr. Stein. You've uh, uh, been a person who's had a broad experience, and we should point out that we're talking probably about three different phenomena here. One is the process by which people get paid back when they lose money to lawyers, okay. the discipline process, and suits against lawyers. That's right. But across the board, since you've been focusing on this issue for a while, how widespread is the problem of lawyers who don't faithfully serve their clients? Well, I think, from, I think we have to uh, make a distinction between ethics and malpractice. Okay. What is the difference? Well, the difference is in malpractice, we focus on recovering money for people who have been victims of lawyer negligence. I think in e ethics, we have a whole different agenda. On legal malpractice, there is a proliferation of lawyer malpractice today. I think the mistakes being made by lawyers, the claims being made against the lawyers are increasing in dramatic proportions. All right, let me focus first on the ethics question, which is a process which leads to a lawyer potentially being disciplined, perhaps suspended or disbarred. How widespread do you think are problems stemming from lawyers failing to do their duties to their clients? Not widespread at all. Uh, there's no question that from time to time lawyers are not faithful to their trust and when they're not faithful to their trust they get involved in our very extensive 
legal ethics system in New Jersey. But it's not a widespread problem. There may be one or two people that have repeated complaints about them, but as in general, most lawyers out there are ethical and do not run into the ethics system in any way. Do you think, Hilton, that we are getting a large number of lawyers who do commit ethical violations caught up? Is this a system catch most people in your view? Well, uh, again, there's a fine distinction between that ethical problem right. and a malpractice problem. I want to stay problem. with ethics for just a minute because I know Certainly. we're going to get into For example, you've had an epiphany of sorts. I mean, you had some problems of your own a long time ago. Can Absolutely. you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, sure. I got caught up in some of the things I sue lawyers for today, and I'm not proud of that, but that's certainly part of my history. I was disciplined and rose out of conduct 15, 20 years ago. And, and part of the underlying problem was a abuse of prescription drugs? Yes. Back then, that's okay. right. That's and, right. And both of the, and, and in a sense, those problems, the very problems you experienced, could have both sets of ramifications. For example, a lawyer now who didn't tend to his files or didn't do his work, even though he might have had an underlying problem, would be probably disciplined, but also would be subject to suit. Absolutely. And and, and again, from an ethical standpoint, I think under the direction of uh, people like Cynthia Ken Bissong on, on, in the Lawyer Protection Program, Bill Kane in the Lawyer Substance Abuse Program, these are all innovations that are catching those those lawyers that have problems, whether it be prescriptive drugs, whether it be stress, matrimonial uh, problems, regardless of the nature of the problems, there are systems in place today to avoid those type of problems. Okay. And I know you're anxious to talk to us about malpractice. Let me go to Cynthia for one other point. At, we mentioned at the beginning of the program uh, a controversy of which all of us were aware, that is the opening up of the disciplinary right. process involving lawyers mm -hmm. and the fact that those hearings are now public. Right. Uh, at the time, there was a great hue and cry there in was. our craft about the potential damage to innocent lawyers That's who right. would be dragged through the mud and then turn out to be exonerated after having mm -hmm. had their reputation smashed. What's been the experience of the bar and what's the attitude about it to any here? Well, there the was a great hue and cry at the time, at, but there are safeguards built in. A, a, an ethics complaint does not become public unless there's been probable cause found to believe that an ethics violation has been committed. So every time a person complains about a potential ethics violation does not mean that there's going to be a public hearing on it. But it's we, only those that have survived to the point where there is a belief that there's an ethical violation that are public. But lawyers generally were aware, or at least the bar leadership was aware right. of those safeguards at the time of the proposal, and yet there still was a lot of controversy and concern that notwithstanding the protections that were built mm -hmm. in that there might be abuse. Has the attitude generally within the bar, in your view, changed and become more accepting of this process? I think that most members of the bar would prefer it not to be public, but what is interesting is when the first ethics, public ethics hearings were held, there was a great hue and cry. There was TV coverage, there was newspaper coverage. Everybody was in there looking at this. Within the next, within the month, nobody cared anymore. Of course, well, there hasn't been TV coverage because cameras can't go into the disciplinary process. Um, is that inconsistent with the concept of opening the whole process up? I don't think so. There's a record created. The record is available. Uh, the fact of the matter is, they the process was opened up, but that it didn't turn out to be all that interesting to people because many times in ethics proceedings, we're talking about technical things that are not things that the general public is much interested in. Well, we were interested, and they wouldn't let us. In, but that's something we'll have to explore a little further. <laughs> Let me go back to you, Hilton. I know you're anxious to talk about malpractice. Uh, tell us what legal malpractice is. Basically, it's when a uh, lawyer errors that we that causes damage to a client. And is, that's is, really in a very simple, abbreviated form, right? This is, that's, I'd like to ahead, call, sure, uh, I've thought about this. I go think ahead. that w the best way to explain malpractice is mm -hmm. the lawyer has made a mistake. Okay. Just like a dentist might make a mistake, or a doctor might make a mistake, or all of your viewing audience mm -hmm. might make a mistake. Not our well, viewers. But, <laughs> you're, but, right. but and, we're, and we're not talking then about theft or deliberate misconduct. No. We're talking about somebody who makes a mistake. Borderline, maybe, on some of those issues. Okay. But m simply making a mistake, that it ends up when, in which a client loses money. Okay. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is, as, as in many of our cases, Ray, lawyers have a tendency to cover up. Uh, they don't want to accept responsibility as a general proposition. They don't want to. Lawyers are different from the rest of humanity in that respect? Well, uh, probably I, not. Probably not, but they're a little bit more adept at it than most in the general population. So do you agree? I don't agree that lawyers uh, have to make efforts to cover up. The problem with malpractice, which of course is Hilton's field, is that you have to prove that there's been a mistake and that mistake has led to damages. Very often there may be a mistake, but it can be cured. And if it can be cured, then you haven't met the element. Of malpractice. Sounds like what Cynthia is suggesting is you could have a case where a client's unhappy because the lawyer didn't call a certain witness or do a certain thing, but that's not the cause of the loss, but the client 
pursue the issue anyway. Is that Ray, a Ray, we problem? receive inquiries by the box load, and I can tell you, I read each and every one of these inquiries. And these inquiries demonstrate, at least over the years to me, mm -hmm. that there are, that there's legitimacy to these complaints. Is that there these any people such, truly have suffered. It's probably an unfair question, but is there any such thing as a typical kind of mistake or a mistake that's commonly made that leads to a malpractice? Well, there's no common thread, interestingly. It yeah. cross-references over criminal law, over matrimonial, commercial, family law. It, it, it touches on every segment of the profession. And let me say this. I've is there any said, because I thought I'd seen in the vast archives here at NJN an article in which you'd said that you thought maybe matrimonial lawyers are more inclined to generate this kind of Most of the complaints we get, let's say 50% okay. of the complaints are, uh, arise from the matrimonial bar. But that only represents uh, a proportionate of the number of cases we actually accept. Okay. And Ray, another point, I think that the majority of ethics complaints arise out of matrimonial actions. Why is that? Because people are in a very fragile emotional state. And there is no happy winner in a matrimonial case. And because there is a no happy winner, you double the potential for people to bring complaints because both the husband and the wife usually walk away unhappy. And it's very easy to say, it's my lawyer's fault. Hilton, do you agree with that? No, I don't. With all due respect to Cynthia, she and I have a point of departure. Okay. I think the matrimonial bar is very country clubbish. I think that they have their own set of rules and regulations that now, and I say to the credit of Cynthia and, and Supreme Court, uh, are, are now examining those techniques and the ways in which they practice law. I think they've got to change the way they practice law. What are the problems inherent? By the way, I'm sure they won't be inviting you to those country clubs. <laughs> no, <laughs> actually, I've never been invited okay. to a function, and, uh, okay. and that's okay with okay. me, Ray. Now, within that framework, what is it that matrimonial lawyers do that adversely and unfairly affects their clients in well, such large numbers? In, in, most, in, in, in most instances, if, if there are substantial assets involved, frequently these clients become annuities. The lawyers don't really solve the problems, but they create more problems. And that's not true in every sense. And again, I don't want to be perceived as a lawyer basher. I'm not. I'm proud to be a lawyer. And I think lawyers like such as Cynthia have done wonderful things for society as a whole. But in this area, particularly matrimonial law, where people are vulnerable, we find in our experience that matrimonial lawyers take advantage of those people. Cynthia had a sense of I disagree. Uh, first of all, because the matrimonial client is often emotionally distressed, they will call their lawyer and look to their lawyer to solve what are really uh, psychological problems or social problems that have nothing to do with the law. And generally speaking, we work on an hourly basis. When a lawyer gets a call, even though it's not related to the law, they mark down their time and they bill the client for it. Now, a lot of clients say, but I didn't talk to you about law, but they did take your time. And the fact of the matter is, that sometimes is the cause of the problem. The client is unwilling and un or unable to accept what is the province of the lawyer versus what is the province of, say, the psychologist or the marital counselor to help people through a very difficult emotional time. Ray, we've seen cases in which legal fees have run 500000 almost a million dollars, and yet the substance of the assets involved in the case were minimal. And the fact of the matter is, if that money is available, many times, not in every instance, many times, the lawyers will promote that type of, you know, anger and hostility amongst the parties as opposed to bring everybody together and trying alternatives to dispute resolutions. Okay. I think you've got a good idea here. Uh, I disagree with Hilton, but we've got people who practice matrimonial law every day of the week, and they can speak very directly to the problems the matrimonial lawyers face, which is a different set of problems than many other lawyers face. Face. Sounds like a subject we'll have to explore more in depth. Let me change the subject a little bit uh, and go back to the question of lawyer ethics. And I uh, have done a lot of ethics work and wind up lecturing about ethics around the country. Mm -hmm. And wh what I notice is that New Jersey's rules, especially concerning a lawyer who steals from his clients, are probably the toughest in the country. Where they essentially, are. under Wilson, if you steal from a client, you're disbarred and you're never coming back. You uh, are. They are the toughest in the country. Uh, it's an automatic disbarment if you take funds from a client. Uh, that separates us from other states. Our ethics system is extraordinarily tough and it is designed to make sure that people do not repeat and to make sure that those who do commit an ethical infraction are in fact punished in some way. We ourselves are very tough on ourselves. You heard before that we even fund uh, a, a fund for people who have been hurt by their lawyers through various stealing and other defalcations. 
the fact of the matter is New Jersey is extraordinarily tough on the unethical lawyer. Now, let me, let me ask you a question, which I think might be an interesting one. We should make it clear that your problems, which were drug-related, were many years ago and had nothing to do with stealing. Right. But let me take an example of a lawyer who has a serious drug problem and who steals or who may have, in addition to the drug problem, a serious pathology. The new head of the Disciplinary Review Board seems to be generating some discussion and maybe even disagrees that all lawyers should be disbarred. What do you think about a lawyer with deep psychological or perhaps drug-related problems? Should he be handled differently or should he be automatically disbarred as have all lawyers for the last 17 years? It took If you to steal a client's money, you should be out of the practice of law. I think that there shouldn't even be a discussion of that issue. Is that, is that discussion, well there is a discussion going on, is that going to lead to a change in your view? Well, it might. I think there have been some instances where there's been a de minimis amount of money that's been taken, and also it's shown that the person is uh, has a serious dependency on drug or alcohol. Now, what we're doing in the Bar Association is we've helped establish a lawyer's um, a fund uh, called the Lawyer's Assistance Program, where we try to help people who've got these kinds of problems before they hit the ethics system, because many of the ethics problems do stem out of some sort of abuse or psychological problem. No lawyer wants to be unethical. So you can conceive of a time when New Jersey, tough as it's been in the past, right. might begin to look at the question of why a lawyer, if there are relatively small amounts with no prior problems but with a, a deep psychological or drug related, or how about if it's a gambling problem? Well, are there the so same thing. So you think there may be changes? See, I, I don't you agree. Don't, you don't agree with that? No, I don't you? agree. If you're going to if you're going to steal from a client, you shouldn't practice law. Go find another way to make a living. And I may be reducing it to its lowest common denominator, but that should be a hard and fast rule. I'm in favor of the rule. I'm not in favor of any change of that rule. You also have to consider: Is the lawyer willing to make restitution? If a lawyer has a deep, serious problem and is willing to make restitution, um, I think that certainly a period of suspension could be very, very helpful to make them see the error of their ways. But it's sort of like confessing you've done something wrong. Confession is good for the soul, they always say. Well, that does favor the lawyer who has money over the lawyer who doesn't in a way that might have nothing to do well, with it. Well, what Cynthia said, that really touched on a nerve because that's one of, my, one of my, my, my primary complaints about lawyers generally is that they don't accept responsibility. I think Cynthia is absolutely correct. If we're involved in an automobile accident, Ray, and we hit another car, we get out and we say, gee, is everybody all right? Here's my insurance card. Let my insurance company take care of it. Lawyers don't do that. Lawyers, from our experience, demonstrate time and time again when they make a mistake, they rarely ever come to the table, advise the client, look, I've made an error here, and I'm sorry for the error. Let, me, let my insurance company step in and take care of that problem. Well, now, that I it, disagree with Hilton. Okay. Let me, let me ask him the reason, then we'll come all. to your disagreement. Now, I'm assuming it's not in the training, it's not genetic. So <laughs> what is it that, in your view, makes lawyers more inclined to do that than, say, dentists or, or other people? It, it, in it's craft? a function of ego. It's a function of losing the client. And our Supreme Court has recognized, ethically, we're bound to admit our mistakes and advise the client to seek other counsel. But it's just, that's one principle that just simply is not followed. Well, judging from our present company, lawyers don't have ego problems. They're all small. But tell me <laughs> why you disagree with him. I disagree with him because I don't think he has the empirical evidence to support the statement, quite frankly. It's a generalization that he's making that I don't think is accurate. I think good, solid lawyers do advise their clients. We are ethically obligated to do it. And we are also obliged, when we find that out, to put our malpractice carriers on notice. Um, it's do all e lawyers have insurance? Not all lawyers do have insurance. They all should. Can clients inquire about that when they retain a lawyer? I think they should. Um, but you have to understand, too, here, Ray, we now have a lawyer population in this state of 62,500. That's up from about 6,000 when I started practicing law 30 years ago. Now, obviously, when you've got more lawyers, you're going to have a few more problems. But, but you think, in percentage terms, they haven't changed, and you disagree with Hilton's analysis that I lawyers are more inclined to try to maneuver their way out. Go ahead, Ray. It's been almost 20 years since I accepted my very first plaintiff's legal malpractice case. It's getting worse. I think what will change is Cynthia. Cynthia says just more of them, but you don't agree with that. I don't agree, but I, I think with Cynthia going out and, and, and lecturing lawyers to accept responsibility, not just for legal malpractice, but generally for accepting responsibility in society for, for having the privilege of practicing law. I think that's, that's the first start in making a so difference. So we vested in Cynthia responsibility for solving this problem. <laughs> let, me, let, me take, let me take it to one other, one yes. other level. This is a small one at the other end of the extreme, but it strikes me as one that, because I've, 
I read several years ago a study that suggested nationwide failure to return phone calls was the cause of most lawyer complaints. Is that a minor issue or a big one, and why is it so? Now common? that is something that, when we talk about an ethics complaint that probably won't reach the stage where it's public, that's a fairly typical complaint. So and so will not return my phone calls. This can often be solved by the lawyers on the local ethics committee calling up so and so and saying, "Look, you've got a client who you're not returning their phone calls. Start doing it." And by the way, the bar association and the Supreme Court are now working on what we call an ethics diversionary program where there would be a local impetus to try to make lawyers who are doing this see that all they're doing is opening themselves up for justified criticism. They should return phone calls. And although that seems like a small problem, it actually can be either a sign of bigger mm -hmm. ones or yeah. a tremendous absolutely, absolutely. irritant. I yep. agree with right. Cynthia. And the problem is we're disenfranchising a large segment of people who use lawyers for, uh, for legal advice because that not returning phone phone calls doesn't rise necessarily to the level of being unethical but that certainly aggravates an awful lot of people yeah. who really don't have an avenue. They don't know, they, they, there's nothing that they can do to solve that problem other than going to the next lawyer. And in fact, they've come to the lawyer for some guidance initially to solve that problem of the That's unknown right. and they don't get the And that, right. that yeah. often happens, by the way, in the matrimonial context. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Back to the uh, matrimonial. That the, yeah. uh, <laughs> right, that the lawyer will, uh, will not, it, not a question of not returning them, but not returning them within 15 minutes mm -hmm. or within the same day. And sometimes uh, it's I actually impossible. I wish we had 15 minutes more. We don't have any more time. <laughs> I want to thank you, Helton Stein, for being thank with you, us. Thank you, Ray. Jacob, it looks like we'll have to focus on this matrimonial question because it's Well, it's an interesting question. Is, yeah. Thank you both for being with thank us. You. Thank That's you. That's it for this edition of Due Process. But we hope you'll join us next week when we turn from lawyers making good on ethics to prisoners paying their way in county jails. Till then, for Due Process, I'm Raymond Brown. shouldn't know that the legal profession does try to take care of these situations. And if it's the only profession that does, so much the better. I mean, uh, perhaps other professions ought to consider doing it as well. But um, it's, uh, we do feel that those who believe they'd lost their life savings only to have them restored by this fund acting on behalf of all the lawyers in the state uh, if that restores their faith in the legal profession, that's great. I mean, the, we think that's fine. <laughs> that's the way it ought to be. Major funding for due process was made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding was provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual, publishers of print and electronic information for and about the legal community, including the legislative manual.